Welcome, everybody, um, to, the to the ACS convention. Um, I want to start by saying thank you um, to ACS for inviting all of us, um, especially me, back. Um, and welcome to the opening panel, Different Ways to Make a Difference, Non-Traditional Lawyers and Their Impact on Law. I have a couple of housekeeping things first. One, please turn off your cell phones. Um, and they ask that you actually turn them off off because the, even if they're on mute, they can interfere with the sound signals. Um, and we will, we're gonna go for a little bit over an hour, I think, and then we'll open up for questions. So there are two mics in the middle, and so as you're thinking about your question, we ask you to keep them concise, like all good lawyers do, and actually a question. Um, so that's, I think that's all I have to do to start with. Um, the bios for everybody are in the convention program, so I am actually not gonna go through the bios in any great detail, other than if anybody has eyes like mine, they probably can't read these cards at the front. So I'm just gonna quickly go down the lines so people know who our speakers are. Um, I'm Lisa Brown, the moderator, um, a lawyer, and former head of ACS, have had a great Washington career in and out of government, nonprofits, um, private practice. Immediately to my left is Eric Liu, who is a former White House speechwriter and co-author of The True Patriot and co-founder of The True Patriot Network, among other things. Next to Eric is Barry Eisler, who is an author of eight best-selling thrillers. Um, sounds like your average lawyer. Uh, including The Lost Coast and Inside Out. And then um, next down the line, Dahlia Lithwick, who I think everybody in this audience knows, uh, senior editor at Slate. Then Matt McGough, who is a nonfiction author and screenwriter who, among other things, consulted and wrote for the last four seasons of NBC's Law and & Order. And then Seema, I think, is the next one, yeah. Gajwani, who is program officer for criminal and juvenile justice at the Public Welfare Foundation. And then finally, Ruben Bowling, um, who is a cartoonist responsible for Tom the Dancing Bug. So we have a fabulous group. Um, <laughs> And you know, when I first thought about this panel, I thought about the number of us who often, who are no longer practicing law, who describe ourselves as recovering lawyers. And the more I realized, as I thought about it, I actually realized that that's an, an apposite uh, term. That's not the right way of thinking about it. Because in fact, most of us really um, are using law, albeit in very different ways. And I know I personally chose law because I saw it as a tool for making a difference, for hopefully making the world a better place. Um, and I saw it as, I think, creating opportunities, opening doors, not closing them. And I think that that is actually what this, the panelists here share is a commitment to using the tools that they learned along the way in law to make the world a better place. And they're doing it in um, all non-traditional ways in the name of the title of the panel, but I guess what I would say is really in creative um, and interesting ways um, that actually can have an impact in a, in a very different way than many of us do in writing briefs or more traditional practice of the law. Um, none is a Supreme Court advocate, um, but I do think that each of them um, does their part to realize the commitments that are on the freezes of the Supreme Court, the equal justice under law and justice the guardian of liberty. So there, I think it's, it's been fascinating to me, actually, to um, learn about these panelists and, and to see what it is that they're doing and the mark that they're having in ways that certainly I never even contemplated doing in law school. I think I'm probably the most, have had the most traditional career of anybody on the panel. Um, and I'm betting that they do not have to dress the way they did. And some of them have dressed up for this, so, but the other benefit is probably. No <laughs> So I think I want to start by actually asking for a show of hands, which is simply how many of you were doing what you thought you would be doing when you first went to law school? How, <laughs> how about when you graduated from law school? Oh, okay. So lots of good stories to come, clearly. <laughs> um, uh, Ruben, let me start with you um, way down at the end. Um, your comic strip, Tom the Dancing Bug, um, has often has legal themes. I think a lot of the um, ACS members are familiar with your Judge Scalia character, with Harvey Richards, lawyer for children. And I, I know that you started the strip when you were in law school, maybe a creative outlet that, um, and in law school, and then actually took it public or whatever more formally when you were practicing at a law firm. So what led you to create it? What got you started on that road? Well, I, I went to law school with every intention of uh, getting a job at a law firm and, and working as, uh, as an associate and going right down that path and then seeing where that took me. And then 
it was while I was in law school, I always wanted to be a cartoonist, um, but that was sort of a silly thing that I had in the back of my mind, the way I wanted to be uh, a shortstop or an astronaut. Um, <laughs> and so I was you know, continuing along in, on my very responsible uh, career route, and uh, there was an ad in the law school newspaper for a cartoonist. Um, I, I'm positive that if that ad didn't appear, I would not be a cartoonist today, because it, they were asking. I wasn't going in there to, 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 to try to foist myself on it. So I said, um, you know, well, they need one. Maybe I'll go in there and I'll do it in my spare time. So I went in, uh, immediately got the job since they did need someone. There probably weren't many uh, cartoonists among my classmates, uh, and uh, began doing it. And uh, you know, I had tried it before and, and was very, very bad at it. I had tried it in high school and in college, and was really awful. Uh, but I wanted to sort of try again, and this time. Uh, I was at least not awful. I was uh, something, <laughs> something clicked, and I really, uh, I suddenly found my cartooning voice, and it happened like that. I mean, I was, I was trying to be, you know, in college, I wanted to be Doonesbury, and then, uh, you know, I just, I was, was never clicking. And then in law school, I just found my own voice, like falling off a log, and I, I started a, the comic strip there. Um, and aside from a year and a half right after I graduated, when I, when I was working as uh, only as a lawyer, um, I have been doing one. Tom the Dancing Bug comic strip every single week for my entire life since that first day that the uh, that, that ad appeared. Um, I just now it's just part of my part of my being. I got it. I have to do one a week. Um, law school was you know not the kind of thing that you think would be very very helpful for a cartoonist, uh, but it's you know it's I'm sure you know people who are in the creative fields and are writers you know that you use everything you know if you. If you worked on a fishing boat when you were 17, at some point in your career, that's getting in there somehow. That's you know the, the knowledge, the, the 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 feelings. So, uh, and I also am very interested in law. So I did I've done a lot of uh, legal stuff in my in my comic, and I'm very interested in it. Uh, one of my I, I owe my my cartooning career really to um, one of my characters that you mentioned, Harvey Richards, lawyer for children. I thought of him while I was in law school. Um, and he's a lawyer for children who treats uh, kids' law the way um, real lawyers treat, treat real law. And it, it came from a seminar I took in law school called uh, Laws, Markets, and Morals with uh, Professor Clark, who then became dean of uh, Harvard Law School. And I just was fascinated by this because the point of the seminar was how we use um, uh, not only laws, but also markets and morals uh, in order to regulate behavior. Um, all the time, and so I began thinking about how kids use their own type of, of legal code um, in order to regulate their own behavior. One of my first uh, comics was uh, Harvey Richards comes upon the, a kid calls him in because someone cut in line, or so, someone wanted to have a friend cut in line, but there's a rule that many kids know: you can give backsies but not frontsies. <laughs> So Harvey Richards advises her to do a double frontsies maneuver, <laughs> and you do a you do a front, you, you, you do a, a, a double backsies maneuver. You put someone behind you, and then you go behind them, and then you're still in front of them, but they're. So uh, you know, I was really using uh, the way that lawyers use the law and and, and manipulate it uh, in order to you know show how people use all kinds of uh, moderators of, um, of of codes in order to do the same thing. Um, so, so yeah, I ended up using, using that. So I'm gonna, um, as you talk about sort of double, double frenzy, um, <laughs> it makes me think a little bit, Barry, about your CIA um, training. <laughs> so, you know, from the playground to, anyway. Um, I, it, Barry's bio says that you know, after Cornell Law School, he spent, um, he uh, went to the CIA as quote, and I'm quoting here, a covert CIA operative where he trained in small arms, long arms, hand-to-hand -hand combat, improvised explosive devices, small watercraft, <laughs> airdrops to friendly forces, surveillance, counter-surveillance, counter-terrorism, agent recruitment and management, and interrogation and manipulation techniques. So I just had to quote and on the like double front similarity yeah. to <laughs> 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 I want you on my side in a dark alley. <laughs> just like the you know average law firm associate life, I think. Um, so did you go to the CIA wanting to write thrillers? Did you come on it from that? What was the, what was the chain of events? 
I, I'm probably such a bad example for so many things <laughs> because you know, when I look back, I can make up this laser beam linear line for everything I did was just setting up the next move and it all worked out exactly the way I wanted, but that wouldn't be true. Even going to law school, I have to admit, I did as what one of my college housemates called YEP, Youth Extension Program, <laughs> because I, I didn't know, I just didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a psych major and I started getting interested in the world relatively late. I call it a kind of intellectual puberty. You know, it just happens to you however, whatever age you are, that's when it happens. And it seemed like my mind waited until I was about 20 or so to open up. Um, but I got really interested in the world. I started reading a lot on my own. Um, not so much for what was assigned in classes, but more on my own. And I'd always been interested in what I now call forbidden knowledge, which is anything that the government wants only a select group of people to know and doesn't want anyone else to know. So over the years, I'd amassed a, a collection of books from places like Paladin Press and Lumpanics Unlimited. I'm sure I'm on all kinds of FBI lists at this point. Books You're like- You're allowed to fly. <laughs> yeah, so far, so far. <laughs> How to Escape from Controlled Custody, and You Are Going to Prison, and the Big Book of Secret Hiding Places, and How to Build Man Traps, and the, the Death Investigator's Handbooks, and 21 Techniques of Silent Killing, I could go on and on. My wife wouldn't let me put these books, by the way. She wouldn't let me put these on the bookshelf until I was a published author. And then now she can tell people, let's just research. He's not really into these things. <laughs> but the truth is, I always was into them. And then at some point in, um, I went to law school because I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. and I, my scores were, so I took the LSATs and my scores were okay. And uh, while I was in law school, I started thinking, well, what could I do that would, that would combine my interests in the world and politics, foreign policy, that sort of thing, on the one hand and forbidden knowledge on the other, and what else but the CIA, of course. So um, I left, I had a, an offer from a DC firm uh, when I graduated from law school, but uh, this offer from the CIA came through at about the same time, so I went with the CIA. It was a really interesting experience. I was only there for three years, and the resume really sounds, makes me sound a lot more badass than I, <laughs> I'm afraid I am. Um, but it was a fantastic experience, a lot of good training. Um, mostly what I learned that goes in my books, aside from, uh, from the tactics and techniques and operator mindset, those things I'm, I'm pretty well firsthand familiar with now, but also the way huge government bureaucracies, particularly intelligence bureaucracies, function or more often malfunction. I don't think that's portrayed nearly enough in fiction, which is to say that realism is not portrayed nearly enough in fiction. And, uh, and so I, I try to stay away from Smurf style conspiracies in my books and you know, guys twisting their mustaches and saying wah ha 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 and stuff like that. Because in my experience, what's really wrong with the country and often what's wrong with the world has less to do with Smirsh and Spectre and conspiracies and that sort of thing than it does with what the intelligence community, I like that it's a community, it makes it sound friendly, <laughs> sounds, <laughs> what, they, what they call it, they have members. Aren't you a member of the intelligence community? Um, more, it's a, usually a matter more of bureaucratic prerogatives and the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing and maneuvering and that sort of thing. Nobody's really trying to do something that's super evil, at least when they look in the mirror, they don't see it that way. But what you get is a collection of policies and practices in the end that are terribly destructive to America's national security and moral fiber too. So these are things, no, I didn't, I didn't go into the CIA thinking I would write thrillers with these sorts of themes, but uh, but over time, I guess that interest in forbidden knowledge and the world and all that stuff, combined with my exposure to writers like Dahlia and uh, Glenn Greenwald and many other uh, writers in the blogosphere who have effectively radicalized me and, uh, and have, <laughs> have changed what started out as just straight up awesome action thrillers into, well, they're still straight up auction, uh, awesome action thrillers, but, but a lot of themes about what's going on uh, in the country today. Dolly, I didn't know you'd inspired him. That's nor did I. So Radi then, radicalized. Everyone, so <laughs> radicalized better, right? I didn't. I want you to know Sorry. I didn't self-radicalize. Don't you? Love, that's another thing. Like some guy, he's just sitting in a room and <clears throat> and he's like self-radicalized. You just want to say. <laughs> just always want to say. Do you really think he self-radicalized or was he exposed to something? Anyway. <laughs> so Dahlia, um, obviously. We're all very familiar with your Supreme Court dispatches, jurisprudence, your writing. I think many of us rely on um, you to be educated um, and smart about key legal issues right now. 
Um, what most people probably don't know is that Dahlia's first full-time job after clerking was as a divorce lawyer in Reno. <laughs> so explain that career path. <laughs> It's true, and, um, and I can't tell you any of my best stories, but I will tell you this one. Um, in, you know, one awesome thing about divorce law in Reno is it always involves either the custody of children or horses, um, and often there's a pawn shop or a casino involved. Like, these are not normal custody disputes where you fight over the Tupperware. This is like you're fighting over a horse or a pawn shop, um, which, is, which is fun. Uh, and I did, I clerked in Reno after law school, and I uh, loved Reno. Uh, I loved Tahoe. I developed a, a, a hefty gaming addiction that we don't talk about. Um, <laughs> We, w we went back for a wedding a few years ago, and all the dealers at Circus, st Circus still know my name. Like, <laughs> my husband was ready to leave me. Um, but uh, so, so just the story that I tell is that, you know, all my friends went to fancy white shoe firms in New York or San Francisco, um, and I was at this crazy street front, you know, firm in, in Reno fighting over um, horses. And uh, we, we got into a, a, a big, big custody fight over a horse. And then my whole firm decamped to Harrah's, which is where all the fancy banquets are, because they're always at casinos. And we were getting the pro bono firm of the year award. And we came back at lunch, and there was a horse tethered <laughs> to my office um, <laughs> with a bale of hay and a pile of horse leavings and a carrot and a note that said, you take her. <laughs> and I just called every one of my friends from law school and said, okay, guess what? I have the best job in the world. You may have nice catered lunches. You may have a snack cart that comes around at 11 o'clock at night, but I got a horse. Um, so, so, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, I will just um, say what, what Ruben said, which is I, I had no notion I was going um, to law school to be a writer. In fact, uh, I didn't think I was a writer. Um, and then I got my first... Uh, my first semester, first grades back, remember that? And, and <laughs> I called my dad and I cried and I said, I'm a middle distance person. <laughs> and that's when I felt like I just didn't have the sort of fine granular brain to do uh, law school. And I, uh, the only thing that I uh, will double down on is uh, amidst all the like despair and failure you're hearing about today and people not knowing what they were doing. I, um, after I got my grades, I actually quit law school. Um, and because I was, uh, hadn't yet learned that you don't put anything in writing, I, I wrote a long note to the dean explaining why it was awful, um, which I then, when I had to beg my way back in, uh, was incredibly embarrassing. So um, I think I'll stop right there. <laughs> Well, Eric actually knew he was going to law school not to become a lawyer, you right? You, did, you consciously chose to go because you wanted to learn a certain way of thinking, a framework, um, I think as, as you described it, in the service of creating a better body politic. Um, and you actually seem to have, maybe I'm creating a narrative that's not there, but you seem to have stayed true to that goal, speechwriter for President Clinton, writing The True Patriot, creating these networks that are all about re-engaging, re-energizing the body politic. Has it been that straight a line? Uh, it, it has been straight a line, I guess, in the sense of purpose. Um, the same motivating engine has been running all this time, which is to uh, be part of something greater than myself. Um, but in terms of actual work and jobs, it's been as zigzaggy as anybody else is here. No, no horse tethered <laughs> no. to an office, uh, uh, or yeah, or, or man traps, uh, uh, to my knowledge. But um, you know, for me, I went to law school, uh, as you say, with the express intention of, of not wanting to practice uh, afterwards, but really with the, the intention of trying to gain command of a way of seeing. Because uh, I'd spent a bunch of years already in D.C. working on the Hill and then working for uh, President Clinton and found that over and over again, the people who I just thought the most highly of in the way that they thought and the way that they handled situations and framed issues and uh, had been trained as lawyers. None of them, in fact, in their roles were actually being lawyers, right? They were a speechwriter or a chief of staff or a, or a this or whatever, but, um, but their way of thinking had been formed and shaped. And I thought, I want some of that, right? And, and the way that I likened it, the, the metaphor I use is it's like, 
going to law school is like getting another pair of glasses, you know, and you just see the world now in dimensions that are not necessarily visible to others. And uh, as somebody who is just so, uh, you know, even vaguely interested in trying to change our politics back then, I felt like getting that other pair of glasses would be, would be really useful. Um, the, the thing that um, was kind of liberating about knowing that once I got there that I wasn't trying to, uh, to practice was that I, you know, for me, it wasn't quite the, the YEP, but it was definitely extended um, playground graduate school. Um, so, you know, I ended up taking five years to get through How law school. How many of school. you think of law school as a playground? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's partly because I took a lot of classes outside of law school. Uh, uh, and just really uh, try to connect with folks from, you know, b back when I uh, started in law school, the internet was just happening, and, um, and so a center got uh, started at Harvard Law School. Uh, it's now the Berkman Center, this, this great center on the study of internet and society. Uh, and to be present at the creation of something like that meant that we were just connecting with all kinds of a really diverse range of folks, right, from tech people to philosophers to uh, two lawyers, of course, but also public policy people, educators, artists, uh, and to me, like, that was exactly what I wanted to do, was to kind of get in the habit of um, learning new ways to connect dots. Uh, and for me, that's been the, I mean, I'll talk more later about the work that I do, but, you know, when I say learning a new way of seeing, it's not just seeing how the law affects life. It's just, it's a new way of imagining, right? And a lot of times the nature of the law uh, training in the law and the practice of law, and you know, I, I actually teach a, a, a leadership seminar to law students now at the University of Washington. I live in Seattle, and th the great fear they have is about the winnowing and the narrowing that the profession, that professionalization kind of forces upon you. And I think there is that danger, but I think part of the, the thing that's great about this training uh, is that it allows you to connect dots in unlikely ways uh, if, yep. if, you, if you keep at it, and it allows you to kind of see uh, kind of interesting uh, causal relationships and connections that might not otherwise have been apparent to, to other folks. And, you know, the, 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 the idea that, you know, when, 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 when Barry was saying he was not self-radicalized, um, you know, I, I think for me, a lot of the work that I do, apart from reclaiming patriotism for progressives, uh, which is th that one project, is around mentorship and community and fostering a culture of pass it on, right? And, and in the same way that no person, there's no such thing as a self-radicalized person, there's no such thing as a self-made person, right? And my law school training made me very acutely aware of all the people around me that were influencing me and shaping the way that I think, shaping the way that I like stuff. Uh, and uh, for me, that way of thinking has carried on in the work that I do, even though I don't practice this. Seema, way down near the end, um, you have clearly been passionate about um, criminal justice issues, it sounds like, from the start. I mean, you're, you did legal clinics in law school in criminal justice, you went to the public defender service, and then you made the change to go to the Public Welfare Foundation and switched from law to policy. Um, was that a natural change, hard change? How did, what led you to do it? It was an unexpected change. I, I, was, I was the person who wanted to be a public defender in high school. <laughs> I wanted to... Um, be a public defender, you know, I wanted to be the person who was there for 20 years, trying cases year after year, and so I'd always planned to, to do that. Uh, you know, and then I found myself one day in a three week long baby murder case, six months pregnant with a toddler at home, keeping me up half the night and, you know, getting Jenks material and rewriting my crosses for the rest of the night. And all of a sudden, the alternative legal career sounded really attractive. <laughs> <laughs> so it, for me, it was obvious in, in lifestyle choice. I, I didn't think that I could sustain the level of practice that I needed to as a trial attorney at the Public Defender Service here in DC um, with a young family. Uh, and I remember thinking at the time that it's very hard to be a lawyer in this town 40 hours a week. and. Um, I think that's that's changing a little bit uh, within more traditional legal jobs. I, I know um, at the Public Defender Service here, I recently had jury duty, so I ran into some of my old friends at the Public Defender's office, and they were saying that the incoming class of PDs, um, among them there were a lot of people who were married, some who had young families, which was really surprising, because when I started, that wasn't the case at all. It was really unlikely um, to be able to, that you could stay in the trial division as a woman with a, with a kid. Um, 
not very many people were married, not many people had children within the office. So that's changing even at the public defenders here, and I imagine that there might be change in, um, maybe even in the law firm culture, although I'm not sure. But I think it's a reason to think more broadly about what kind of legal job you want and to think kind of outside the box, not only about what you want to do and how you want to impact kind of the world, but also how you want to live. Um, and this is, this is maybe a good time for that, given the job market, you know, to think creatively about, about what you can do and how you can do it. Um, but I, um, at around the same time that I switched jobs, shortly before I was working, um, I was volunteering on um, the Obama campaign's criminal justice policy group, and I was kind of the glorified secretary of the group. And I would, you know, set up the conference calls and take notes and put together all of the reports. And uh, so I was exposed to a lot of um, experts in the field. And I recognized uh, being exposed to those folks how kind of narrow my view of the criminal justice system was as a public defender. And I also recognized that there was a lot more to um, impacting change than just doing it at a direct services level. So it was a, it was a really exciting opportunity to move to policy and to try and uh, see things from a different perch. Well, it, crime is clearly um, a great muse, I guess, and certainly very popular on television between law and, and I have to say I'm a total junkie for criminal <laughs> shows. Um, and I know that many in this audience would love to have the chance to write for whether it's NCIS or The Firm, Law and Order, any of them. So, Matt, the question that everybody here wants me to ask is how did you get your job? Um, <laughs> well, uh, there was some good fortune involved. I mean, uh, you know, any job like that, it's, it takes uh, a little bit of what Ruben mentioned, being, you know, being in the right place um, at the right time and there being um, an opportunity for it. What I was hired to do was not to write. My job initially when I was hired for Law and Order was, was as their uh, legal consultant, um, which is, you know, I've always wanted to write. It's always been the goal for me. Um, looking back, again, it's not clear, you know, it wasn't clear to me back then how to get there, but going to law school, um, um, you know, was, you know, I, I have always been interested in crime stories. To a degree, it's, um, you know, my, my grandfather was a murder prosecutor in Brooklyn in the 1940s and 50s, and um, I grew up kind of hearing stories about him from my dad, and so it was, um, I think, part of what made me want to go to law school, and I think when I began law school, I was, um, you know, under the misapprehension that it was going to be kind of a continuation of my liberal arts college education, and I was disabused of that pretty quickly, but I also, <laughs> was much more interested in the classes, even though it was very different than I anticipated. It was intellectually engaging, and I was able to work on things like uh, uh, Fordham had an excellent human rights program that I got involved in. I got to see the world through that and uh, picked up all these tools. And this similar way to some of the other panelists have mentioned, it's kind of uh, learning a new language or learning mm -hmm. tools that are um, you know, very, uh, Flexible, and then um, you know. It, it, uh, so, in hindsight, again, things fit together um, in a certain way, um, and uh, you know. So the fact that I had a legal background, that I had a, a, a clerkship experience, where I was able um, to see a number of criminal cases play out in federal district court in New York, I think those were the credentials that I was, um, um, you know, was hired for. But um, for me. You know, it's just being drawn to the to the storytelling aspects of it. I want to go a little deeper in sort of how now for folks, how law, how you can use law now a little bit more. Um, and so, um, Barry, according to uh, News Press, um, your best-selling thrillers, quote, combine the insouciance of Ian Fleming, <laughs> the realistic detail of Tom Clancy, the ennui of Graham Greene, and the prose power of John le Carré. I know that they did not add the scathing wit of Justice Scalia or the advocacy powers, uh, prowess of Walter Dellinger. Um, <laughs> so did you learn to write that well in law school or despite law school? And <laughs> how does your legal training help you, you know, inform your writing now? That's something that interests me generally because there are a lot of novelists <clears throat> who were former lawyers, Scott Turow and um, John Grisham, probably the two best known, but quite a few others. And obviously you do a lot of writing in law school uh, and different law schools probably have different training programs or no programs at all teaching 
law students to write, but I think the most important thing is this. Question authority. <laughs> no, but I'm serious. If you've, if you've ever worked in a big firm, you know that the writing sucks. It's really bad. And the reason it sucks is because it's always sucked. And young associates come to the law firm and they don't want to seem stupid, so they do really stupid things because it's always been done before. I mean, for example, have you ever seen a contract? This just makes me crazy. It's so basic. They spell out numbers, like two, T-W-O, and then they put it in parentheses as a numeral two. You know what I hear when I read that? I hear two. That's two. <laughs> like, like, in case you're stupid and you can't read the word too. You know, that's just how it reads to me. And I've asked dozens of lawyers, why do you do this? And no one has a good answer. It just kills trees. So, so my posi I just question everything. I'm like, that's stupid. And all this, this passive voice, nominalized, nominalized way of writing, like, uh, in the event that the party of the first part shall not have completed payment. I'm like, what? Oh, you mean if Bob hasn't paid? Okay. <laughs> Now I understand you. So, so I, just, I just did it my own way, probably because to a fault I'm not afraid of, of looking stupid. Sometimes I really am. But, but I just feel like, like the saying goes, there are no stupid questions, only stupid people. And I just thought, this looks dumb to me, and I'm not going to do it too. And, uh, and so I think I learned good writing habits just from always questioning, why is it being done this way? Does this really make sense? And I would encourage everyone to do that, because if nothing else ever gets better in the legal profession, for God's sake, help make the writing get better. You can do it. We should be on a mission. So I would say on balance, yeah, um, to the extent I write well, it's, it's because I resisted things that people were trying to get me to do and questioned what they were doing. If it made sense, then maybe I would do it. But if it, didn't make sense, if it didn't make sense, then I would resist it and find a better way. And I, I think that's a, good way to, that's a good way to make the world a better place. It's, I was definitely one of those in law school who I remember sort of it was like, just the facts, ma'am, mixed in with a little dry analysis. Um, and then you leave law school and you go to write your first brief and you realize, ooh, I really need to learn to tell a story. You know, it's a compelling narrative that's going to make a difference. Yes. Um, and I, similarly, I think we've probably had, you know, forests felled by the number of law review articles that have been written on things like debunking originalism. And, but few, I think, have had the impact of one Tom the Dancing Bug cartoon, oh. when, um, <laughs> which the absurdity of lawyers and judges trying to channel the framers um, comes, is, is very obvious when a two-fisted, time-traveling Judge Scalia crashes into the front parlor of James Madison and tries to learn exactly what was meant by a particular clause of the Constitution. <laughs> so um, Ruben, I think, uh, is it the combination of legal thinking and creative writing that is actually the magic touch for illuminating actually very complex questions that lots of Americans don't even have time to study? Yeah, that's, I think that's, uh, it's critical. You know, a, a lot of what I do is, is not about Judge Scalia and, and um, you know, tackling uh, really meaty legal issues and, and boiling them down. A lot of it's really stupid, ridiculous, uh, general humor about Australopithecines and giant aliens. Uh, so I sort of mix everything up. But when I do that, I think it's, it's, uh, it's really important to be uh, funny about it. Um, and I think that's, it's a great way to make a point. I think Jon Stewart is, is so effective as a pundit because he's so effective in, in using humor to, and Dahlia does a, uh, uses humor a lot in her, uh, in her columns uh, very explicitly. Uh, a lot of this stuff can be very dry, and if, and if you find an opening uh, with an analogy or some, some, some humorous way of, of discussing it, uh, you're much more effective uh, as an advocate, uh, uh, even though that's not my role, but uh, if it were, that, that would be the way to do it. I think the, um, the human brain, this is actually one of the things I learned in, in that same course, Laws, Markets, and Morals. We read some article, I don't remember the reason why we read it, but that basically it was showing, the art, point of the article was that uh, the human brain is designed to process anecdotal information, mm -hmm. stories and narratives, not analysis. Uh, so, you know, you could tell someone, um, I was thinking of this example, I always think of this when I was, uh, had little kids and we were in the, uh, in, camping out, uh, in, in, in the Berkshires, um, you know, I, I knew the odds of a bear attack were minuscule. There was like one bear attack in the Berkshires in like a hundred years. Uh, but there was an article about a baby who was attacked by a bear somewhere in the Catskills while, while we were out there. 
And that's all that was in my mind, because this story, forget about the statistics and the analysis, the story of a baby being attacked by the bear, man, I was, I was you know, in a very uh, visceral way, I, I'm on alert. I'm, a, I'm protecting my, my kids. So uh, stories and, and something that's very visual, uh, I think are, are very effective in, um, in uh, convincing people. And it's, it's a much more powerful way to get a mm -hmm. message across uh, than just with, you know, just the facts, ma'am, uh, analysis, um, here's what the law is, here's what happened to my client. Uh, so, um, yeah, in some ways, uh, using, using humor, stories, uh, visual cues can be, can be extremely effective. Uh, Dahlia, one thing that's always struck me about your work is not just the, you know, despite what you said a minute ago, there's a lot of really nerdy analysis that goes into what you do, um, but is your incredible wit as you're doing it. And do you feel like you are actually able to make points and that you're heard differently because of the use of humor, similar to what Ruben's saying? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Ruben nailed it. I think it's just, um, it opens a, a point of access with your reader or your reader, I guess. Um, it's just they a read. sort of- my, my, my readers read. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what does the looker and cartooner look like? Um, reader, reader works uh, and user. Um, so I, I just think it opens a channel that is a little bit more forgiving it's a channel that gives the benefit of the doubt. It says, all right, if you amuse me a little, I might not set your hair on fire for what you're saying. Um, and I think it disarms people. I mean, I think there is a visceral reaction to humor that allows people to say, all right, well, I still hate everything that, that he is writing or that she is saying, but I'm going to give a little leeway because they, I just, you know, something happened and some stuff came out of my nose, so it must have been <laughs> funny. And, and so I think it's just, um, you know, and, and, and um, if I could have done this through interpretive dance, that's what I would have done. I mean, this just happens to be, you know, I, I think things are funny, but um, it wasn't ever conscious that I would tell jokes and make people interested in the court, although I, I will say, you know, I'm really struck listening to us about how many of us are talking about taking these incredibly abstruse technical ideas, like torture uh, or the Constitution, and translating them for people. I mean, that, it seems like that's such a big theme here, and I, I just think um, anything that you can do that takes something that most people see as like, Neurophysics is just mm -hmm. too complicated. Mm -hmm. Anything that you can do to say, actually, it's not too complicated, and moreover, it's really urgent that you care. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's, it's just, I'm hearing it over and over yep. again. So for me, that humor does that synapse. It just, it just closes that gap and says, here, not only should you care, but I'm going to try to make this as painless as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and Matt, how about in, in your medium? Because you actually, uh, if I have this right, um, it was the thought of going to a law firm that um, actually gave you enough courage to start writing. Um, and, and, but, you, but legal issues are a huge part of what you um, are, have written about, obviously, in Law and Order and on the, the article that you have coming out right now and the book you have coming out on the cold case murder. The book um, needs to be written before it okay, can come out. Sorry. But <laughs> was, um, the article's out. Do you actually... Um, when, you're, when you've been writing for Law and Order, um, do you come at it with a, there's a point I want to make here? There's a, because I'm all, often struck with some of these shows that how obviously there's some relation to some, something that's just happened in reality too, but do you think that's somewhat the same way that Dahlia does in your yeah, medium? absolutely, absolutely. I mean, pr the primary responsibility, and again, there's many more experienced Law and Order writers out there in the world than me because I came to the game a little bit late, but um, you know, what I learned in my experience there is you know, fundamentally, you're trying to entertain people. You don't want them to turn the TV off, but it is a platform through which you can demystify a lot of things and explain things in a in a way and examine issues and use the characters to kind of voice different uh, perspectives on complicated, frequently controversial issues. So, yeah, the 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 best episodes of Law and Order would be the ones where. Um, you know, Jack McCoy is kind of like he's, uh, you know, he's kind of a cartoon character. I mean, he's like a mythological figure as much as, um, you know, uh, who he represents um, and, you know, the things that uh, you know, just kind of 
uh, his persona within the world of the show um, uh, was trying to, uh, you know, very much uh, demystify and uh, explain things in a way that make an emotional impact on the audience, get people talking about things that they might not otherwise be exposed to or interested mm -hmm. in. Um, so yeah, very much so. Um, it was a blend of drama, but also I think, you know, um, trying to engage with the issues of the day and um, um, hopefully spark, you know, more conversations about some of the issues that are raised. Mm -hmm. so, at least that's aspirationally, you know, not, 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 not every episode succeeded probably, but um, that's, you know, what um, we aim for, I think. And Seema, in a, in a very different way, I think, you, I, I have no doubt that the work that you spent, the time you spent, um, the Public Defender Service, and now going into the foundation world, having spent a lot of time um, trying to entice money out of foundations for ACS, <laughs> um, it, having your experience, you're, you're able to translate for people who haven't been in that world, um, the upfront and close, what it really means if you're a child in the criminal justice system and what you're fighting for. I would imagine that there's some very, you know, you speak a certain language and you're able to then translate it for foundations into who then can actually turn around and make a difference. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> I learned a lot about translation as a public defender because you have to talk to jurors. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, was a really valuable experience. And it uh, and I hear a lot of that from, from you all. You have to be able to communicate to people who are not lawyers necessarily and don't necessarily care about these issues, uh, a story, and uh, some complex legal concepts, and also make it very uh, urgent and important to them. And so that was a skill that I think is very helpful in advocacy, mm -hmm. <clears throat> generally. Um, my experience as a public defender, I, you know, I, when I was a public defender moving into policy, I thought that I would bring a lot of value to philanthropy on criminal justice because I've worked with folks who are harmed by the system. You know, I've represented defendants, I met their families, I'd be in their neighborhoods talking to victims and to witnesses, and so I really had a front seat on the suffering and the, <clears throat> the harms that are caused by some of our broken policies, but I'm not really sure how valuable that was, a lot of people have worked with folks who are harmed by the system, enough are. Um, I think what was really valuable about being a public defender um, to, to supporting advocacy change systems um, was you get, a, you get a very clear sense of how to win um, as a public defender, as a trial attorney, probably as a litigator more generally. I found when I started doing policy work that there are a lot of advocates that sometimes lose focus on winning because they get caught up in, um, in being right and in, and in principles and being true to principles and philosophies, get caught up in ideology. And as a public defender, you can't. Your client doesn't care about your, your ideology. You know, they want you to get the best outcome for them. And so it, you, you get a very clear-eyed view on what you need to do to get the outcome that you want. And that level of strategic thinking, I think, um, has been helpful in, um, in assessing what are the best ways to impact as much change as possible. So I think that, that has been something that I didn't expect. I think also having been a public defender gives me a level of credibility, which I might have needed uh, as a woman, as a young woman, coming into um, policy atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So Eric, I think that probably a lot of people in the um, ACS community have sort of long heard the claim that conservatives are the careful analytical thinkers and progressives are warm-hearted, soft-hearted, uh, <laughs> result-oriented. Um, have you found actually that the critical thinking that you did learn in law school that you were talking about has ended up making you a more effective advocate for progressive patriotism? The That's a great question. I, I think um, it starts with unpacking the premise of the question, I, I guess. The, 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 so, so one of my projects has been uh, with, with this book, The True Patriot, just trying to reframe and reclaim patriotism itself in more progressive terms, right? And th though it's not about an individual pers person's narrative, uh, and certainly doesn't involve humor generally, uh, it, it is about recasting a narrative, right? There is a narrative that dominates in American political life about patriotism, uh, and frankly, it's generally not one that progressives get a lot of traction off of, right? Uh, and, and over the last 30, 40 years, 
the right has gradually uh, claimed patriotism while the left, in many ways, has walked away from it. And that's been to the detriment of both. And so that piece of work has been in, in great measure about thinking like a lawyer about how you reframe and reclaim a story, right? And it's not just saying, me too, I can wave the flag or put on the lapel pin uh, just like you can. It's about thinking, what are the undercurrents? What are the foundations of this story, right? If there's a story being told by conservatives about what it means to love your country, unpacking that, right? That story has a moral dimension. It has a family dimension. It has a values dimension. It has a dimension that has to do with valuing certain things more than others, valuing tradition and sanctity more than equality and fairness, right? Which is a perfectly valid way of kind of mixing your kind of moral foundations, right? Uh, but if we're gonna be rigorous about it, then as progressives, we have to think about, well, how do we recast patriotism in moral terms that actually can win the hearts of a great majority of people, right? And you know, our contention is, my colleague and mine in, in writing the book, The True Patriot, is that if you take seriously the idea of country before self, you know, McCain's slogan of country first uh, several years ago, and unpack that, you get to a set of principles like mutual obligation and sharing of sacrifice and deferral of gratification and service to others that are inherently progressive. They are, you, you do not get from that conception of patriotism to every man for himself uh, or let the market sort things out, <laughs> right? And yet those are stories that are out there. And I think, so I think law school trained me in many ways to think about what is the architecture of the story, right? Uh, and that is as, as applicable to a political concept like patriotism uh, as it is to a, you know, a, a specific narrative of a thriller uh, covert operative or of a cold case uh, uh, or of a specific court, uh, court, uh, ca course, uh, ca case in court. I think the, this kind of meta-narrative ability, something that law school really uh, instilled. The other thing I would say, though, that law school um, shaped in the way that I think about this stuff is my obsession right now, uh, even apart from progressive politics, is just in trying to reimagine and reinvent civics, and how we do civics in this country. Um, and, and this is quite frankly a bipartisan catastrophe that's going on in, in the country. And so Justice O'Connor, uh, you know, is, is, I'm involved in the project with her, but Bill Gates Sr., all these people from across the political spectrum. And when you take seriously the idea of civics and try to think about what that contains when you unpack it, uh, there are, too, all the ways that we were trained to think about, think about things in the law, not just literally the law. Of course, you know, the law itself and how a bill becomes a law is a central piece of what we call civics. But more importantly, the idea of how do you frame a question? How do you create a community around a particular answer to a question? How do you manipulate story and history in different ways? Uh, for, you know, how do you create some common base of knowledge and understanding and references uh, so that people can have higher order discussions and debates and be talking about the same thing, right? These are baseline things that you, you intuit in law school and in the practice of law uh, that have really shaped the way that I think about how we reinvent and reimagine civics. That, you know, as to the how, I want to get to where everyone else in this panel is doing, using humor, using visual communication, using things that are not just eat your vegetables, civics. Right? Uh, but in the first place, thinking about what civics constitutes uh, uh, requires a lot of the same things that I think the, the learning and the practicing of law uh, helps home. What would, I'm going to go a little off topic, would not completely, but given that I think everyone in this room would agree with your goal, what should we all be doing? On, on, and civics. Patri on civics. On civics. Yeah. Well, you know, I have this kind of tripartite framework for thinking about civics, which is values, systems, and skills. Uh, so, so the values piece is kind of what I was talking about in the context of true patriotism. Like, there, there, what are the moral foundations that undergird living in a pro-social way in community with others, right? Um, and you can argue about which values matter more, but, but have some, right? And, and know them, <laughs> right? Uh, and and I, I mean that. This is what we wrote in The True Patriot. You may or may not agree with our conception of patriotism and our moral framework, but it is quite important that you have a moral framework and that you're conscious of it and able and willing to articulate it uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the beef that I have with progressives is not so much that we're mushy-minded and not analytical thinkers enough. Uh, it, it's that we kind of resist talking about morality because it might offend somebody or it might, you know, suggest that one notion of morality is preferable to another. Uh, and the facts of the world are, A, that in many cases some are better than others, but B, more importantly from a, in a democracy, most people believe that some are better than others. And so if we want to actually 
build durable majorities that share our worldviews, it's important to think about the values piece. The systems piece is just understanding the systems that make the world go round, right? And everybody gathered here in this room is deeply steeped in the system called the law, right? And all of us know the system called politics and government, and how a bill becomes a law, right? But there are other systems as well that have completely shaped our lives, the job market today, right? That's a system called the marketplace. There's another system uh, that, you know, uh, on this panel that we've been talking about, which is the system of non-governmental organizations and philanthropies. There's the system of the physical ecosystem around us. I mean, there are all these systems that shape the way what our choices and opportunities are, right? And to teach civics well is to teach people to see systems, right? And understand those, the world in those terms, which I think the law does as well. The skills piece then is just where I think, you know, a law school, a, a legal education prepares you most for, which is the skills of advocacy, the skills of framing, the skills of arguing, the skills of negotiating, the skills of resolving conflict, uh, navigating diversity, right? Uh, these are all, the, people aren't just born knowing this, right? Th these hard skills that make a person effective or not effective uh, in civic and public life. Uh, but I think everybody in this room, you know, we're preaching to the converted here, but everybody here in this room gets to be, you know, your own choir director. You get to go forth and preach these same things about master these kinds of skills, right? Whatever your politics may be, be intentional about and mindful about mastering these skills. That value system skills framework for me is just how I get my mind around a, a word, civics, that can be very abstract to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think no matter what your stage of career is, what field you're in, what domain you're in, um, you can, in your circle, start intentional efforts to get people focused on, on all three of those pieces of civics. So Barry, I, this is a little bit of an interesting transition, but I actually realized thinking about your work, like your latest novel, which is Guantanamo, Blackwater, the CIA interrogation tapes that are still missing or were destroyed, um, or look at 24, right, at the, t at the show 24, which had people, it really it was very much ultimately about values, as you're talking about values. You're making these, po it, these points or issues are raised, and you know, you've even had Supreme Court justices taking note of, um, 24. Yes. So um, do you think, again, it kind of goes back to the conversation we were having before about how things are heard differently, but that, you know, you're, I, I wonder a little bit, it's, you know, there's some Supreme Court cases that seem a little bit like fictional reality to me sometimes in terms of the decisions, and then there's your fiction, which is very based on reality sometimes. It's an interesting, each one seems to inform the other. Yeah, if, you, if you're interested in <clears throat> anyone who says that, well, fiction doesn't have all that much of an impact on the way people see the world, um, you're not paying attention to the close nexus between the right-wing noise machine and, uh, and shows like 24 and novels by guys like Vince Flynn and Brad Thor. And Dahlia's written at least a couple excellent articles that I know of on this very subject and that I drew on in, uh, in some of my own work and some of my own aspirations because if you're subjected to a steady diet of Jack Bauer saving America by torturing a guy who invariably does know where the, the suitcase nuke is buried and whether he should, whether the red or blue wire should be clipped to diffuse it and all that stuff, if you're subjected to a steady diet of that, you'll start to think that torture is good for national security you won't realize how dreadfully bad torture is for national security. Even leaving aside the, morality, the, the immorality and the illegality of torture, and this is something that disturbs me right now in our national discourse, and I think the right has been really effective at this cross-promoting its fiction <clears throat> to change the American narrative on torture. When people talk about torture, the, the baseline assumption is that it will always be good for national security. It's like, should we do it? I, you know, it stretches the law, maybe that's not good. Or, you know, what would happen if one of our servicemen is captured? Maybe it's not so good, he might be tortured too. Those are trade-offs we have to, have to consider. But the axiomatic foundational assumption of the argument is always, but it'll be good for national security. We'll torture these bastards and we'll get the information we need. It'll always be actionable, it'll always be accurate, and it'll always save the day, just like on 24. And, and one of the things I really want to do as a novelist and blogger <clears throat> is change that false assumption so that people can realize just how badly torture has damaged America's national security. And that for anything valuable you might get by torturing someone, 
you've created <clears throat> so much hostility, so many new jihadists, so many supporters, so many financiers, so many people who will look the other way rather than report the emplacement of an IED to American authorities because maybe they would have reported it, but you know what, if Cousin Ahmed's gonna be tortured when he's taken in, I, I, can't, I can't live with that. All these things, <clears throat> no one, it seems to me, or very few people are asking the question, what does all this torture cost America? There's always an assumption it doesn't cost anything and it's only, it's only potential benefit. And that's crazy. So to the extent I can depict issues like torture in Guantanamo, those <clears throat> supposedly destroyed 92, originally two, but then 92, uh, missing CIA interrogation tapes depicting waterboarding and other forms of enhanced interrogation. Um, the better I can depict these things in a realistic way, the way these practices actually affect America's national security, I think it makes a great thriller Number one, because it's much more realistic. I don't really like fantasy thrillers that much. Um, but also, maybe we'll have a certain effect of getting under people's radar, where instead of making a straight, logical, evidence-based argument, and there's obviously a very significant place for that in our discourse, but also you can, you can invade, you can, you can get under any defenses people might have by just depicting, <clears throat> rather than arguing, but just depicting the results of something that's going on in the country. And for this, I think, Fiction can be extremely effective. Again, as we've seen uh, from the kind of cross-promotion the right is doing with various thriller novels and shows like 24, but also, um, I mean, look at, um, look at what Ayn Rand was able to do with, uh, with Atlas. I mean, this is a completely ridiculous <laughs> claptrap. I hope I'm not insulting anyone in the room, but objective is it's embarrassing. It's just a basically excuse for childish, uh, the, the triumph of the id and selfishness. And yet, by putting this stuff in a novel, she was able to persuade I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people, including, including people who are supposed to be smart, like Alan Greenspan, <laughs> that this is all a really good idea. And, uh, and then there are, of course, positive examples, too. I mean, 1984 is my favorite example. Um, George Orwell wrote um, an essay, um, not politics in the English language, sorry, the, the name eludes me for the moment, but it was about the same themes that he covered in 1984. And the essay was effective, but very few people talk about it today. Everybody knows what we know about uh, to creeping totalitarianism from the novel. So I think there's a really strong place for fiction and drama in altering the understanding of and the discourse about various practices that are terribly deleterious to America's moral fiber and also our national security. Have you all, and I'm gonna ask this question and then we'll turn to, we will turn to audience questions after this so that people can start lining up to ask questions. But I'm interested, based on what you just said, but whether you all can draw, it's probably not a straight line, but a line from some of your, like your writing, to actually, um, a, whether it's a changed law, a changed policy, or, cha or even, or maybe it's just that you see people talking about things in a different way. And you can start with me? Yeah. Um, on, on the patriotism work, uh, we, we like to think that that is starting to happen. I mean, we, the, our, our book, The True Patriot, uh, which I wrote with my uh, colleague, Nick Hanauer, came out just as the 2008 presidential campaign was getting underway. And so, um, you know, that ended up being a great contest of differing conceptions of patriotism in, in some ways. And I think President Obama, uh, you know, Took some hits early on, and you know, got his lapel pin on, and and uh, and so forth. But I think, um, you know, he. Uh, it was kind of ironic that he ended up taking those hits because he deeply intuits a lot of what uh, we were writing about about the, the ways to to reclaim this language. Uh, and I would say that you know, his election, uh, well, his campaign was very successful in in taking this language and idea of reframing patriotism. But his election, I think, has made it more comfortable for more progressives, uh, uh, both elected and not elected, uh, to speak an unabashed language of patriotism. Um, you know, a very unscientific sample. I, I live in one of the bluest precincts in, in a, one of the bluest cities in the country. I live in, in Seattle. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's one of the districts that does seriously contemplate having Dennis Kucinich come and represent us when he gets redistricted out of Ohio, right? <laughs> because they love him so much. Uh, and it was, and around the time I wrote my book, I flew an American flag uh, at my house. And I got really interesting kind of quizzical looks and responses from my neighbors. Like, I, I thought you were a Democrat, you know? <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? And, and I was like, dude, I am a Democrat, you know? Th th this is the point, right? Uh, and, and I just, you know, I stuck to my gun, so to speak, or, you know, stood by my flag and, and kept it up there. 
Uh, and now, you know, three years later, um, there are flags all over Madrona, you know, in my, my neighborhood of Seattle, right? Uh, and I think these things are contagious both in the words that uh, we use uh, and in the habits that we find uh, permissible, right? Uh, so I feel like I, I can't claim a direct line, but I feel like um, I'm part of a I'm part of a complex adaptive system called the culture, right? Uh, everybody on this panel is a shaper of that culture, uh, me in a very modest way. Uh, but I think all of us in our ways, you know, the, 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 one of the most basic precepts of cultural life and civic life for me is society becomes how you behave, right? And if you took that notion seriously, you know, not that you know, this one act of torture will get canceled out by that one act of kindness or what have you, but that you know, if you chose to be uncivil, if you chose to be disparaging of the flag, if you chose to be this, that, or the other, that society in, in quick fashion, in contagious fashion, would become so as well, um, that would change the way we, we approach things. And uh, for me, around patriotism, I do believe that it's incumbent upon progressives in particular uh, to reclaim and to, you know, both the language and the iconography uh, of this idea uh, and again, not in a wholly celebratory way, but to say that what it means to be American is to push this country ever closer to living up to its ideals, and God, I love that we get to do that. And I got, I got, I, I get that we love, I, I love that we get to do that here in a way that no one else on earth gets to do. Um, and the more we talk like that, the more that will spread. Uh, and, you know, I, I do that in very earnest political ways. If we do that through fiction, if we do that through cartoons, if we do that uh, in, in the um, commentary that we have, uh, it will tip the culture. Anyone else want to, Dahlia? I, I would just say, I mean, I get chills when I hear Barry say I radicalized him because, <laughs> you know, I walk around in fuzzy slippers at home. Like, <laughs> dude, I am not a radicalizer. <laughs> um, but, but I guess I, I, I just want to echo something Eric said that is so important, which is, which is um, I think that, that there is just a wall of, of conviction and passion and belief on the right in this country. And, and, and I just think, you know, you're looking at a panel of really fierce people who are trying to speak to that wall, you know, just pinging a rubber ball against it and hoping something's going to make it mad, you know? And I, and I guess I just really feel like, um, you know, I, I can't overstate, you know, first of all, it's just an honor to be with people like that, but I think it's so important. It's so important to be fierce and brave and be willing to have your head ripped off morning after morning in the blogosphere because there's a wall on the right that thinks the 14th Amendment doesn't say what it means, doesn't mean what it says. It just doesn't. And there's, you know, a wall on the right that thinks that the First Amendment just doesn't mean what it says. And I think, you know, we have to be the crazy, crazy people who keep saying, that's just got to be wrong. And so I think, you know, I, I don't know what the impact is, but I guess if the alternative is silence, that this is okay. Yeah. That guarantees <laughs> yeah. a, a result. <laughs> Anybody else want to add? Yeah, d well, just oh. quickly, the same sort of a specific manifestation of what Dahlia is talking about. I'm very keenly aware of brand issues partly because it's, um, it's just important for my, the, living, the living I make through my novels, and also because it's a subject that interests me very, very much, the way brands can affect people's minds and really cloud their judgment. I don't, very briefly, because I don't want to get all, all political, but for example, a lot of people think that Obama is liberal, when in fact on, on war, secrecy, transparency, the rule of law, he's at least as radical as George Bush was before him. But he talks like a liberal, he seems to look like a liberal, and he's a Democrat, and so people cling to the notion that Obama is liberal. It's very interesting to me the way a brand can far outlast the loss of its underlying substance. So I'm aware of my brand because it's important to the way I make a living and because when people read my biography, I can sound like kind of a badass because the CIA and the small <laughs> arms and you know, all the man trap stuff. And I have a black belt in judo and all that. And so I think it puts me... <laughs> it, it, puts me <laughs> it puts me in a good position uh, because of this brand to take a position against war as a tool of foreign policy. War is a terrible f tool of foreign policy. It really should be a last resort. Um, and I think that people sometimes associate these notions, for example, that torture is not only illegal and immoral, but is also terrible for America's national security. They tend to associate these things with granola eating, libtards, um, communist, pinko, fellow travelers, and things like that. 
And if you've worked at the CIA and you seem to have all these other kind of manly credentials and you, and you take these positions against war as a tool of national policy and, uh, and opposing torture for every reason you can imagine, then I think there's a little bit of an advantage. It makes people pause for a second and say, huh, I wouldn't have expected, almost like Eric talking about flying the American flag, and people say, really, I thought that was a, no, of course not. That's an American thing. It's not a one, it's not a one party or another thing. So I try to leverage my brand to the extent that I can and the kinds of stories I write in such a way that will, will cause something to click uh, behind the wall that Dahlia's talking about, maybe. I mean, you can only reach so many people, but really you just have to do it one at a time. Any questions, audience questions? Um, I, I <clears throat> I'm from New York, another blue, somewhat blue uh, part of the country, although, and sometimes we wonder what's going on in the rest of the country, but I want to come back to this, this, this wall that you're talking about because it's a pretty big wall and it's pretty intimidating. And I, I think we, we uh, some of you mentioned, you know, who is an American, and I'm oftentimes, and I think some of you out there are up there are oftentimes feel like we're really American. We, we're, we're very patriotic, you know. Uh, in New York, we, you know, we we were victims of 9/11, et cetera, et cetera. And I think uh, I also had my American flag and so forth. But we're really in a period now where who is an American is coming up again in terms of immigration. So I'd like you to just talk about like, like why, how can we kind of change this narrative? Because it seems to me it is part of our history. You know, it's like we embrace immigrants, and yet what's going on over here? We're attacking. You know, and, and these people are not part of us, and they're aliens, and you know, and maybe we got to change some of these decisions back then about even birth, you know, people who were born here. Uh, that's scary, just as much as all these other things. So maybe maybe talk about how do we get more Americans to embrace what what I think is the reality out there, but you know, there's a big disconnect. You know, I I. I I think the, the only thing I would say to that is, I mean, it's, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely right. We are in a moment right now, even apart from immigration politics, I mean, just because of globalization, because of the rise of China, because of the rise of the rest, right? The, um, that the, the notions of what an American is are in, in flux in some ways. And that whenever you have that kind of flux, whether it's cultural or economic, there's lots of anxiety that gets played out in, in something like our immigration politics right now. The, to me, I think the, the, the only way, the only durable way that we can create a bigger story of we is to create a bigger story of we. Uh, and, uh, and to return over and over again to the, again, the, the values underpinning of what it means to be an American, right? The, the, this is the kind of great, fascinating thing about the, the birther obsession, right? Um, that President Obama embodies just about every aspect that you would want of Americanness, uh, and yet, for you know reasons we, uh, that are obvious, um, that that notion lives on that he's not quite American, right? And uh, and it lives on today. I mean, I think it's still one of the uh, on the New York Times bestseller list uh, uh, books that continue to contest his um, his citizenship. And you know, I think the the thing that we have to do is return over and over again to what are the common values here. What are the shared values? Um, and, and the idea, and again, back to story, right? I think about what brought, you know, everybody in this room at some point can tell a story about how their family became American, by choice or not, right? But they can tell a story about how, at their point, at their link in the chain, they've chosen to stay American. You're here in this room, right? And I think we have to start telling stories about why that is, right? Um, in an age like this right now, why? Why do I stay American? Why do I want to put a lot of my energy into uh, reclaiming patriotism? Uh, and that has to do with the promise uh, and a set of ideals here that, again, uniquely, that, you know, look, I, I'm one of the perhaps uh, rare progressives who is very willing to claim uh, out there, uh, to claim American exceptionalism. That's a phrase that is associated with the right, right? And, and I believe deeply in American exceptionalism. Because I believe, you know, for all the obvious reasons, this panel would not be possible in China, period. 
you know, and China is great and it's getting greater, but this panel would not be happening there. This conversation would not be unfolding there that way, right? The, our, our paths would not have converged the way that they have converged here. And that is a great thing about this country and you would not have asked the question there, you know? And so I think, you know, returning to values and returning to the stories of how we got here um, is, is what we have to keep on doing. Um, to push back. I mean, there are specific fights on immigration law. There are specific fights to have on the 14th Amendment and birthright citizenship and push back on, uh, you know, on some of these outrageous uh, uh, notions. But at the most basic level, it's just, it's a constant act of claiming, you know? And that's what, when, 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 you, when, when the right is excellent at using something like 24 to amplify, you know, a policy point of view, what that is in pop cultural terms is an act of claiming over and over again, claiming territory. Right? And I think we have to have this mindset of we constantly stake the claim. It, doesn't, it is not self-renewing. Ruben, I have an uh, eight-year-old son right now who loves cartoons and wander, you know, is usually quoting, them, quoting to me, them to me during the day, frequently Doonesbury, um, uh, with comments about <laughs> my parenting skills. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it makes me realize the potency of cartoons, obviously, and that the resonance. And it's another way of communicating and of, of getting to people very quickly often, and it can have tremendous both potency and um, durability. I don't know if you have some other thoughts in terms of what we're talking about right now and how you use that, your forum for that. Um, well, a lot of it comes back to what okay. we've been talking about, what I, you know, I made me answering the last question about, you know, telling a story and visual. I'm glad he's reading the uh, Doonesbury in a newspaper. That's, uh, oh, I was gonna say, that's, that's, that reflects my age, not yeah, his. That's, that's, that's wonderful, and that's, that's really what's going on because Comics, I think, have traditionally had a huge impact because they grew up yep. with newspapers, and newspapers used to have a, this huge impact. They were, they were, you know, each citizen's uh, link to the to the rest of the world. Um, up until maybe 15, 20 years ago, um, that was a hugely important part of every household. And so, the thing that has humor in in the newspaper, uh, the comics, uh, and something visual would be what. You know, especially mm -hmm. kids, but I think you know. Well, certainly polls have always uh, borne out that's what kids and adults would, would move towards. So um, yeah, com it's, it's very it's a very uh, powerful medium. You know, it goes back to what I was talking about. If if um, if we if we argue about you know what 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 George Bush's impact was on the environmental laws um, uh, during his uh, tenure. Uh, you know, we could have, I could have a debate with someone who's conservative about what, what happened during his tenure, but how much more effective is it to just draw him with a big pipe uh, from coming from a factory uh, pouring into, uh, into uh, a lake, which is what I've done, and, you know, not that that changed anything or it changed anyone's mind, um, but, you know, I guess it sort of feeds into what you guys talked about, uh, contributing uh, to the culture. You know, when you first asked about, you know, what impact uh, we've had my first impression. My first response was none. <laughs> I've, had, I've, had a I've changed a single person's mind. Um, but you know, listening to you guys talk, it is true, and, and you're, you're very thoughtful response, Erica. That that you know we are we're you know contributing to a culture and we're making our voices heard. I felt very much uh, alone at the start of the Iraq War, uh, being against that, and every single week doing a comic against it, and seeing you know. Uh, it was considered unpatriotic to be against that war, and it was a, it's hard to remember just how real that was. I mean, you really uh, coming out and saying things against that war uh, was uh, hazardous to your career, and I lost papers for it. Uh, it was, you know, I really felt like a voice in the wilderness, not only because the conservatives were so uh, vehemently for it, but so many liberals uh, went to that side, and. Um, you know, if, if, if it was a very, uh, it was a very scary time. So maybe, you know, I had that first reaction, but maybe, you know, whatever effect it had on, maybe it, it emboldened somebody, to whatever effect I had in doing a comic every week, going, coming mm -hmm. out against the war, finding a, a, hum a new humorous way, uh, <laughs> week after week, hopefully, so keeping it uh, fresh and interesting, but trying to, you know, really make that point, because I felt it was so, so important. Uh, you know, maybe maybe that did have some mm -hmm. effect on the, the larger culture in a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question for Ruben, actually. Did your <laughs> law degree give you more confidence to take that stand? Um, did, I mean, because mm -hmm. in some of my writing, I feel like that I have these tools. It's not for someone else to say, 
you know, whether I can or can't take the stand, I, I have the confidence of knowing that I can read and interpret things on my own because I have this training that many other people don't have. And, you know, your uh, background is fairly unique in your field. And so did, was that helpful? Did it give you the strength to say, even though people are opposed, I'm going to um, move forward in this way? Thanks, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, in a general way, uh, having gone to law school and learning to uh, stand up for myself and, and, uh, and take on positions forcefully, um, I think was, was, was critical of that. Uh, sometimes uh, not being fair in, in the way that you, you know, I, sometimes I, when I'm writing a comic, uh, I think, well, what about the other side? And, you know, and I, I say, wait, wait a minute, I'm, a, I'm a, not only a lawyer, I'm a cartoonist. <laughs> I don't have to be fair. I'm a, <laughs> it's the worst thing I can be. I'll be, it'll be boring. And uh, so, yeah, so having, having the, uh, the strength to, go, to just force my way in there and, be, uh, and, and say my opinion uh, very, very strenuously. Very often, though, when I do take on a, a legal issue specifically, you know, like you mentioned uh, my character, Judge Scalia, who's a sort of uh, two-fisted version of Justice Scalia, um, I have a lot more confidence that, that w in, in my view of, of originalism, um, or even having a view of originalism, uh, uh, than I would have otherwise. And so I, you know, my, my feeling is I'm right, um, and here comes my comic, and that makes for a much better comic than, you know, I'm not sure about this. It makes it, makes it better, uh, not only for advocacy, but f hopefully funnier and, and uh, just a better piece. Mm -hmm. yep, question. Thanks. Um, a, a lot of you are talking one way or another about using media um, to affect the culture. Culture is an incredibly um, complicated and diverse. It's like a lot of very different moving parts. Uh, you know, and, and there are an awful lot of different we's in the culture. And, and one of the things contributing to that, uh, among many, that you haven't talked about much, and I'm interested in that you haven't talked about it all that much, is the effect of technology on all of this. So, uh, you know, I, I open that up to all of you for comment. I can take this. Um, as, a, as a defender, we relished CSI as public defenders. Uh, I know that there is at least one other public defender here in the room, and you know, in every trial, we'd be like, "What do you mean you don't have fingerprint evidence?" You know, <laughs> like, you should expect <laughs> fingerprint evidence, ladies and gentlemen, because you know you see it on TV every day. And I, I think that I, it, I can't overstate how important these guys are in affecting kind of the cultural um, memes that exist out there, um, and how important that is to advocacy. Um, on all levels. And I think what's also important is to recognize where the public is on different issues, what the narratives are out there, and then to also exploit the ones that are helpful to you to get your point across. Because it may be that the overarching narrative is one that the right has dominated, but there might be also something just like the CSI, you know, the value in, 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 in holding a prosecutor or the government to a very high standard of proof and demanding that they put on enough evidence uh, to, to um, show that your client is guilty. But you know, there are also all sorts of ways that you can exploit the, the narratives that are out there, and I think it's, it's important to, to think hard about the culture, um, the technology, the, the, the novels, the television, uh, the comics, out there to, to, to pick and choose the narratives that are helpful to you and to exploit them. Maybe I would just add briefly that, you know, whenever people, <laughs> it's been a while now since someone has been like, oh my God, the internet, <laughs> discuss, you know, and, and I sort of like, those, those days are, I think, I think we've all got to the point where we know it's not going anywhere. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I confess to being kind of ambivalent about uh, new media, uh, which I guess I shouldn't confess to since they pay my you. <laughs> mortgage. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I, I would say of, of new technologies that all the same things that were said of the printing press uh, are, are said of, of the internet. Um, it is both the best thing that ever could have happened and the worst thing that ever could have happened. And you muddle through. Um, you know, I get very anxious when I hear Justice Breyer, for instance, saying, oh my God, you know, the internet is so different that maybe we should just scuttle all free speech doctrine ever, 
because you know someone can burn a Quran in uh, in Florida and you know people will riot in Pakistan and in fact then it happens uh, and it looks like maybe Justice Breyer is right uh, but I guess I, my, my thought about just you know the media and technology generally is that I think it you know it's it's created some pernicious bubbles it's created I think without a doubt a, a, a less civil discourse and I think it's created. Uh, two bubbles of discourse where, and I think this goes to Eric's point, we, we talk past each other and, and in fact scream at each other more than we talk to each other. And I think those are all, it, it would be, I think, folly to say the internet and new media hasn't, and, and cable television haven't contributed to those things. But I also think that uh, some of what is very, very best about the way we talk to each other and the way that we disseminate ideas is attributable to uh, the media and to technology. And so I think we want to be really careful, first of all, about identifying what the real problems are as opposed to just saying, ah, it's new, it must be bad. Um, and also, I think, really, really honoring the, the things that, that technology enable us to do, uh, not just in this country, but around the world, uh, in the interest of creating an, an us instead of a me. One quick thing I would just say about technology is, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the thing that Justice O'Connor has created called iCivics.org, but it's this web-based, it's, it's both, it's using the web, but more importantly, it's using gaming approaches, video game approaches to the teaching of civics and the it's teaching of, uh, <laughs> a, 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 of the law, right? Um, and um, to me, I mean, I agree with everything Dahlia just said, both the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of new technologies. Um, but what something like iCivics shows is the promise of, again, upending old models of how you, how you teach some of this stuff, right? H have any of you ever heard of a thing called the Khan Academy? Anybody? K-H-A-N, this guy Saul Khan, who's a, I think a former hedge fund guy, uh, created this thing on the web, uh, which started with short little eight minute lessons in mathematics. And, uh, then kind of branched into the sciences and all these very homespun short YouTube little videos um, and it's become this incredible phenomenon hundreds of millions of users now and it is upending the way you think about how you do school right uh, and what part is supposed to be homework and what part is supposed to be with a teacher right because there's such effective little packets uh, of instruction I believe there's a huge opportunity to do a Khan Academy for civics a Khan Academy for the law in a way that is you know for non-professionals uh, that uses media and technology that way to, to break some of the, the, frankly, the monopoly that, uh, uh, that exists around how these kinds of things are taught. Uh, so I think there's tremendous opportunity there. Thank you. It strikes me that progressives find this kind of internal comfort in consistency, that, uh, which is a kind of fidelity that the right doesn't seem to have any issue with. And what, what strikes me about that is it gives them this kind of ability to react very nimbly to issues that crop up. And there's no need to actually go through it and think about where did I stand before, what's my, you, you mentioned, Mr. Liu, moral systems and being able to articulate them. And for a long time, I, I tried to do that. And I found myself being backed into logical corners by my friends on the, the ideological right side of the spectrum who would just come at me and, and would be able to hold this belief that we should have small government, but also should be able to stop me from marrying a man, that we should invest in and our communities should care for one another in this very Christian kind of way, but that we shouldn't provide for one another's, another's health care because that's socialism. So I'm wondering, what is, the, what is the panel's view on the utility of consistency and when should we decide, you know what, I don't care whether I'm being philosophically consistent. This is something I think is right. I'm not exactly sure why, but it's a gut feeling, and so I'm going to go for it. <laughs> I'll answer that one first. For God's sake, don't adopt the failed tactics of your enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to give you a quick example of just what I'm talking about. Last night, I had dinner with an old buddy from the CIA. Great guy. We got to talking about torture because we're both CIA guys, former and, and current. And uh, he's kind of mixed on it. And he broke out the argument, which is, um, you want to talk about torture? People jumping off of a burning building to their deaths. Torture? Let me tell you about Danny Pearl, who was decapitated. That's torture. And I said, so you mean we should take our, our moral and behavioral cues from Al-Qaeda? We should look to Al-Qaeda and say, what are they doing? 
I guess it's okay. And he didn't have a good answer for that. Nobody does. So I think it's always a mistake, and you can go on too and say, so let me get it straight. We beat Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, Communist Russia, all of whom use torture, and we beat all of them. And now we want to use torture, the tactics of all our vanquished enemies. We didn't use it to beat them. You want to use it now. Does that make sense? So consistency, thinking that because the right is inconsistent and occasionally it looks like that gives them a tactical advantage, in the long term, it's a terrible disadvantage to be inconsistent. In fact, this is something progressives could learn in their messaging. It's a terrible disadvantage. And what I do is, one of the things, probably the best thing I learned in law school, is this, extracting principles from fact patterns, <clears throat> patterns and then testing those principles by applying them in other uh, factual situations. So if someone ever says to you, uh, I'm a small government guy, but men can't marry. Then say, but if you're small government, why would you want the government to interfere here? You know what I do all the time? When people say they're small government, I say, that's fantastic. You must want to cut military spending. Because you do know that the military <laughs> is part of the government. <laughs> and so these are all, I think of these things as kind of like positive attacks. What you're doing is you're taking your enemy's premise, whether it's right on the surface or just underneath the surface, exposing it for what it is, and then showing how false it is by subjecting it to another fact pattern. One more example like this on torture. There's a guy named Mark Thiessen, who's a former Bush speechwriter, classic chicken hawk, who now writes for the Washington Post, which, by the way, many people think of as a liberal newspaper, again, showing the power of a brand to outrun all the loss of underlying <laughs> substance. Anyway. Thiessen writes for the Washington Post, and he once had a, a debate on CNN with a guy named uh, Philippe Sands, who wrote a terrific book called Torture Team about the Bush administration. And uh, what Thiessen said is, look, the reason we have to torture is because there was this one guy, I forget which one, Al-Zawahiri, not Zawahiri, al Zakari, I can't remember. Anyway, we had a jihadist in custody, and we tortured him, and he told us that um, this is what you need to do. You torture the brothers, and then eventually they reach the point where they can't resist anymore, and then they're, they're okay with Allah to tell you what they need to know, what you need to know. So you should do it. It freed me to tell you the truth when you tortured me, and you should do it to everyone. And Thiessen is quoting this guy approvingly, and this is Thiessen's basis for advocating torture. Now, Philippe handled him pretty well, but if I were there, I would have done a couple things differently. I would have said, let me make sure I understand. So you are advocating a policy because a, torch, a, a terrorist, a jihadist, told you that that's what you should do. Does that make sense? Mark, yeah. you, are you suggesting that we take our policy cues and direction from terrorists? Have you been duped? Are you, are you an unwitting dupe? Are you actually doing their bidding for them? Because you just said that we should do what terrorists tell us to do. Just expose the underlying premise. And if there's an inconsistency, you'll always have something to expose. Don't be tempted by what seems easy that they can take all these positions. Yeah, they're small government, but they're anti-gay marriage. Yeah, they're small government, but they're, they're for the big military and a lot of war. Don't, don't think of that as a convenience or a tactical advantage for them. Use it to expose an attack. <laughs> Sorry if, if I was And being if you too don't, Barry's going to put you in a man trap. <laughs> Let me tell you how as, I really feel. <laughs> well, as this uh, wonderful panel um, comes to a close, I just want to ask everybody to um, give sort of a just very short, if you want to leave the audience with a little bit of advice on how to use law creatively, really to make a difference um, with the great legal education they're getting, their careers, what would you say? I would say use law to learn how to listen many times better than you listen right now. Um, when used properly, a legal training really makes you pay attention to what people are saying, what they're not saying, how they're saying it, um, what their body is betraying, and, and, and so forth. And I think if we do that as citizens at every scale, right, one to one, one to a hundred, one, to, you know, I mean, just, that will be for the benefit of the country. Because I think, you know, as Dolly was saying, there's, a, there's accelerated by our media technologies today, there's a lot of communicating, but not a lot of listening. Um, and I think that's one of the most core civic skills that um, is sort of underdeveloped uh, in, in all of life, in K-12 education, you, ha you, you name it. And 
I think as people with legal educations, we have no excuse uh, not to be attending to uh, how to listen with precision, how to listen uh, in ways that kind of distinct, uh, distinguish emotions from facts, from values, uh, how to listen uh, for what the moral underpinnings of what a person is saying, how to listen for the fact pattern, you know, all these different varieties and variations in how to listen. Uh, and I think if we can do that, it'll serve you well in your careers and your lives, but it will, I think, strengthen uh, the culture. You can just go right down the line. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think as, uh, as all the panelists demonstrate today, there's a lot you can do with a law degree besides just becoming uh, a regular, certainly a corporate lawyer. If you think outside the box, there is just so much value to which you can uh, apply a degree in law and all the training behind it. So I would, I would look for something that makes you really happy, where you really feel like you can make a contribution. And whether you wound up at law school because of a careful plan or it was more of an accident, you'll still get a lot out of it and it still has such wide applicability. Try not to think of just doing the normal thing. I mean, life is pretty short. If you, can, if you can find that thing that really just, that you're so passionate about, that makes you feel like you're really contributing to something, as Eric says, that's larger than yourself, a law degree can take you in a lot of different directions and try to have an open mind about what those directions can be. I, I think I'm gonna say um, the same thing, but with less violent imagery, which is um, just <laughs> that, you know, I think it's so striking that when I went to law school, I was just set and determined to be half the person I was uh, going in when I came out, I just thought if I was, you know, only wore gray and carried really heavy books, then I would have succeeded. Um, and, you know, had a lot of footnotes in even my letters home. Um, so <laughs> I, just, I, I just think, I think that, you know, you're looking at a panel of people who sort of, it, you know, Eric talked about whether law school narrows you or, or widens you, and I think that's your choice. Your choice is to, to be narrowed or widened, and I would strongly, strongly advocate looking at the people on this panel and saying each and every one of us came out of law school and yet something, there was something else that we were passionate about, uh, and that was so passionate that you know we had to do it uh, for our jobs, and, and uh, I also just really wanna flag what Seema said at the very beginning, and I would say include your life in that, not just your job. I certainly uh, would have made different choices if I didn't have small kids, but you know, my life is uh, like yours. You know, it wasn't gonna work at a big firm with little kids. And so I, I just really, really urge you to ask yourself every morning, am I bigger than I was when I woke up or smaller? And if you're smaller, um, something's grinding you down and really, really ask yourself whether you wanna be spending all that money to be smaller than you were uh, coming in. Uh, I would echo everything that uh, you know everyone on my right has said. It's been helpful for me to think of my law degree, uh, you know, a, as a tool, um, a, a, as something that um, you know. So, for instance, most rec recently, I've, the story that I wrote for the Atlantic is a true crime story. Uh, I've not done that type of writing before, and when I became interested in the story, uh, and I, you know, I went down to court in Los Angeles. I've been in courts before, um, and you know, there's the press corps there. You know, so there's reporters from newspapers and magazines and you know but I've not done that before and there was uh, at the very beginning it was uh, a lot of doubt about whether you know I haven't done this type of writing before I've done other types of writing which is kind of similar but you know what I kind of fell back on is the fact that okay a lot of these other writers don't have the legal training that I have and I don't need to be intimidated by you know I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be intimidated by um, uh, you know the the minutia of what the arguments were that day in court because I've experienced some variation of them either through law school or uh, through clerking and um, you know what I kind of gradually realized is that it was, it was something that um, um, that I could do because of my training and so you know the the, the law degree like technology um, um, there's there's limitations to it you know it's bigger than any of us these are huge forces none of us up here have answers about how things are going to continue to unfold with things that I care about like uh, journalism and newspapers and um, you know those are really obviously important parts of our culture and our society and um, um, but it, it, it seems to me, just for my own work it's been helpful to think of it as something that's empowering that I don't have to rely on someone else I 
have these tools that I've picked up that you know I can use to advance, you know, whether it's my own work or just um, you know uh, to learn more about things that I want to learn more about. I don't have to go through uh, you know other sources. I can go directly to them myself. I mean, um, you know, you have tools that that, that you pick up. Seymour. Thanks. I would I would say you know remember what the remember the fire that brings you to a you know, a, a convening like this. And, and also think broadly about how you can engage in cultural criticism. I think this is a great panel for thinking about that and the ways that you can impact um, change and, and uh, advance your beliefs. But if you aren't as talented as the other people on this panel, like I wasn't, consider, consider getting involved in policy and advocacy because it's, a, it's an, an amazingly powerful tool for, for actually advancing change and, and, and changing the world more generally, impacting people at a bigger scale. Um, and you can do it through philanthropy, you can be a staffer on the Hill, but just don't lose the, the thing that brought you there. Um, you, you kind of see, I, I see when I work sometimes on the Hill, a lot of generalists kind of have deadened their sense of justice and their sense of, of um, civic duty and service that, that brought them there probably early. Um, so if you can, try to remember why you came to this and then think broadly and creatively about how you can change the world. Um, I would say if you want to use the law to make a difference in the world, don't become a cartoonist. <laughs> <laughs> Find something else. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, before we thank our panelists, I just want to invite everybody to join us for the gala dinner and keynote address by the Attorney General Holder at 7 o'clock tonight in the Presidential Ballroom, which I believe is basically right behind me. Um, and please join me in thanking this terrific panel. Thank you.